What is an assumable loan? How do assumable loans work? What are the pros and cons of assumable loans? Well, that's what we're going to dive into in today's episode. At the moment, there's a lot of conversation out there, a lot of gurus, if you will, telling every buyer in the market to go find somebody that has a super low interest rate and assume their loan. So in today's episode, Josh, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Somebody inspired us to uh, actually do this episode off one of the YouTube lives that we do. And you know, because there's a lot of questions surrounding the topic. So let's start, I think, at the very, very beginning and, and just say what an assumable loan is. And then we'll talk about why people are wanting to do it in this market. It, well, we talk, Jeb, a lot on the show about wanting that time machine back to lower rates and or lower prices. So this won't do anything in terms of getting you back to the time of lower prices, but it absolutely does get you back to lower interest rates. How much lower that interest rate is depends on when the borrower or the when the seller took out the mortgage that you would be uh, assuming. So in simple terms, you are able to take over the financing on the home that you are purchasing in certain situations. So we're going to go through it. Not all mortgages are eligible for assumption. Um, you do have to meet requirements. It varies some by loan type, but it truly is a time machine back to a much lower interest rate. And with rates pushing above seven and a half percent now, even a three and a half percent interest rate, you are 50 percent lower uh, on on the interest. And it makes just a world of difference in terms of what that monthly payment looks like. So it can be a benefit to the seller if they're in an area that's moving a little bit more slow, but it is absolutely a benefit to you as a buyer if you can make it work. Got it. And, and so making it work is is the difficult part, right? It's it's easier said than done in many instances and not necessarily the qualifying side. It's more of finding somebody that is willing to let go of their current loan with a current super low rate and you as a borrower having to fill that equity gap, if you will. So let's talk about that because I think that's one of the misconceptions about assumable loans. It's the idea that, hey, you have a 3% interest rate. You're willing to sell me your home. You have a loan that is assumable. I'm in a position to take over that assumable loan. I'm going to qualify, but no one talks about that difference in what someone owes versus what the home is worth because of how much appreciation we've got over the last couple of years. So I think let's kind of back it up here a little bit and just talk about that. And then we can talk about the process of actually assuming someone's loan. Well, let's go into detail of the three main types of assumable loans, FHA, VA, and USDA. All three are government programs and all three of those explicitly allow assumptions. Doesn't mean anyone can assume it. We're gonna go through what you have to do to be eligible and to qualify for it. But with all three of those, what is the key or most important feature? It's low or no down payment. USDA, no down payment required. VA, no down payment required. FHA, three and a half percent down payment required. So anywhere from zero to three and a half percent down payment. Now let's compare that to if you want to assume a loan on a property that was bought 2020. Let's say pre-COVID, January 2020, someone purchases a property for $300,000. We've seen about 40% appreciation on that, that property. So really you're talking probably it's worth $450,000, mm -hmm. somewhere in that range now, $400 to $450,000. So for argument's sake, let's say it was VA or USDA with zero down. So someone bought the home for 300, took out a loan for 300,000, over those three years, they probably paid it down to 285, maybe 280, but you've got a gap of 100 to $170,000 there that you have to come up with. So if you go and get a regular VA or USDA loan to buy that property, no down payment required. You're going to have some closing costs. You're going to have some prepaids to, to establish your escrow impound account, but it's going to be much, much lower than what is required to cover that equity gap. The seller is not, the, the seller in this situation is saying, hey, I'm cool with you assuming my financing, but they're not saying I'm cool with walking away with my equity and appreciation over the long haul. Like your literal best case scenario would be someone that bought in the fourth quarter of 2021. That home has probably only appreciated 10 to 15%, but they had an interest rate close to the lows and should be well below three and a half percent. But the reality is most people probably bought prior to then, 
but refinanced somewhere in that window during COVID. So you're looking for a COVID era interest rate somewhere from two to three and a half percent. And you're looking at a home with significant appreciation, most likely that you're going to have to cover that gap one way or another. Well, Josh, I mean, with that being said, let's think today, interest rate seven and a half percent. We're pushing probably eight percent. We're probably going to hit eight percent on a 30 year fixed. I would think just based on the way bonds are trading at the moment, just the volatility in the market. So if someone out there has a six percent interest rate, a five and a half percent interest rate, not something that's not even super low, that could be something that somebody is willing to assume in this market. Is is that fair to say? Well, I don't know. Let's go back and, and look at last week's episode where we were talking about people that own a home and need to get cash out of it and that idea of a blended rate. So we talked about if you owe $100,000 and you have a 2% interest rate and you need to take $200,000 out, you wouldn't take a new second mortgage at 9% because your blended rate is going to be higher than what the current fixed rate is. So in the same situation here, you would look at it and say, what would my interest rate be if I did a zero down, three and a half percent down VA, USDA, FHA to purchase? And what is the blended rate if I have to get a second mortgage to cover some or all of that gap? So is there a number uh, well above three and a half percent where uh, interest where it would still make sense? Absolutely. Is that number all the way up to five and a half, six percent? Not sure. You would need to run the numbers. And generally, Jeb, this is where we say it's important that you're working with an expert that your loan officer can go through those numbers and help you work that out. If you're looking for an assumption, an important feature of this is there is no role in this process for a loan originator. You are going directly to the seller's lender and managing that process yourself with basically clerical staff at the lender and they're going to give you a checklist. Hey, we need all these items. You send it in. They go through it. So you don't really have an advocate on your side like you do on the mortgage side not good or bad. It just, it is what it is. There's no pay for that person. Um, no role. It's just not set up that way on uh, assumption. So back to your question, would it make sense? It's quite possible, but you're going to have to Google a blended rate calculator and see what that looks like. If I'm taking over $300,000 at 3% and I need to get $150,000 at eight and a half, nine percent we need to see what that blended rate looks like and see if it makes more sense to get your own new mortgage, or does it make more sense to take over that seller's mortgage? Yeah. And, and the reason we're not talking about conventional loans here is because most conventional loans aren't assumable. So, you know, maybe you're in a position where you have a large down payment, right? Maybe you are going to go conventional and now maybe you're willing to consider an FHA loan or a VA loan on the first because, you know, with the interest rate and the MI combined, you're still going to be considerably lower than you would today on a conventional loan anyhow. And you have the ability for the large down payment then in those cases, it makes a little bit more sense. And we'll talk about how to find these properties here in just a little bit. But Josh, what is the process? You know, we, we talked about, you know, there's not really an advocate on that on, on that side. You're, you're approaching the lender, but, you know, you find somebody that's willing to, uh, you know, give you an opportunity to assume their loan. What is the kind of the progression from that point? You are going to find out from the seller who is your lender? What is the servicing contact? You're going to contact the servicing department to say, hey, this is a VA loan. This is an FHA loan. This is USDA loan. We would like to assume it. What is the process? And they're going to mail or email you out a package that's going to be a checklist. And it is exactly like uh, getting approved for a mortgage. You have to show that you meet their credit criteria. They're going to pull a credit report. You have to meet the debt to income requirements. You have to have an acceptable employment history. So it's going to look a lot like qualifying for a new FHA or VA mortgage. You know, and Jeb, kind of closing the loop, we talked about that equity gap and how you, you have to cover it. Um, this, that's going to have to be in the package. So if there's a $100,000, $150,000 gap there, you're going to have to explain to them, hey, how am I going to make the seller whole? And are those uh, an acceptable source of funds? So just to close that loop, we talked a little bit, bit about going out and getting a new second mortgage. You talked about, hey, maybe you were going to do a conventional loan. You have a big down payment. You can make that payment out of pocket. I guess sort of the third and last option, if the seller doesn't need the money right away, 
the seller can be your lender. They can lend you that gap. And there's a second mortgage with a, a note and a mortgage or a deed of trust to the seller. But all of that has to be accounted for in the package that you are sending into the lender and their servicing department to approve your assumption. So you're going to show your income your assets for coming up with the equity gap and your credit history. So very, very similar to getting a first mortgage. You're just not dealing with the professional mortgage originator. You're dealing with the servicing staff at the seller's current lender. Gotcha. So we've talked about some of the benefits of assumable loans being, you know, the potential of a lower interest rate, the potential of some fees, some closing costs being reduced and or eliminated entirely because you're kind of avoiding some of the process that you would have otherwise. Um, what speed is potentially one we have written down, Josh, the, you know, the idea that you don't have to go through 30 day escrow and, and buy a home. You might be able to do it quicker by dealing with the lender directly. I guess you and I have had, you know, depending on the bank, you know, and depending on the time of the year and what's happening in the housing market, some banks move really fast in those situations while others take 45, 60 days. So it's one of those things. It's hard to say how fast that process is going to go until you're actually in it. So planning something is going to be a little bit more difficult, um, it, at least the way I look at it, because there's no certainty on either side. The lender doesn't have to do anything um, in that situation. They can kind of move at their own speed. But with that said, Josh, there's also some drawbacks. We talked about the equity gap. What are some other things that come up you know, on the, on the drawback side of assuming someone's loan? It's just hard to find one. So think about this. Uh, your home is going to be your home, your residence, your family's nest home base for the next three, five, 10, 15, 20 years. So you are rightfully fairly particular about where you want to live, what that home needs to look like, the amenities, the condition, the design, all of those things. So now we're going to say, well, let's put a big filter on here and narrow down the field to only assumable loans. And in practical terms, we already talked about it. FHA, VA, USDA are always going to be assumable. Most adjustable rate mortgages are assumable. All Fannie Freddie fixed rate mortgages are not going to be assumable. They have a due on sale clause as part of the loan documents that says if this home gets sold, that loan is due and payable. And that is part of the value of those loans in the secondary market is an investor knows there's no potential for this to drag on forever. This person is either going to pay us out over the 15, 20, 30 years, or they're going to refinance or they're going to sell and we're going to get repaid in, in whole. So from that perspective, it's just the limited availability. How many homes are there out there that would work for you and your family that have an assumable loan and also have a seller willing to cooperate with this? Part of it, Jeb, we were talking before the show, uh, a year ago when we were looking at listings spiking, there were more homes on the market. Mm -hmm. Sellers were having to either cut their prices, give concessions, be cooperative. We have not seen that in most markets. You may be in a market somewhere around the country that is tilted towards buyers. And if so, this is going to be a much better option for you. If you're in a market where a seller has three offers, one of them's cash, one of them's a 20% down conventional, and one of them is you saying, hey, in the next 30 to 120 days, I would like to work with your lender on keeping your loan. What do you think? They're just going to move on to one of the other ones. So it really comes down to the strength of the market that you're operating in and your willingness to be flexible in terms of what you're going to buy. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, there's very little benefit to the seller um, outside of getting their property sold, especially in a, a multiple offer situation where you have other people that don't need to assume your loan, right? I mean, if it's a friend, family member, somebody you're trying to help out, maybe you would go through that process. But if you have somebody giving you a full price offer, strong down payment, the money is the money, right? Especially if time is a consideration, then going that direction is, you know, is probably the better fit versus working with somebody um, that, that has an assumable loan. Now, Josh, you mentioned earlier, finding somebody with an assumable loan is, is, you know, is the difficult part and not even finding somebody with an assumable loan, but finding somebody that assumable loan wants to sell has a rate of somewhere that you would find, um, attractive. I mean, it can, it just limits that scope entirely. And quite frankly, there's not really an easy way to do this. There are some websites out there, um, that aren't really consumer facing. They're more realtor broker facing like myself. We have access to them. One that comes to mind, Property Radar. 
um, something that we use here to be able to gather data and 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 they have all loan data right because it's all uh personal information it's filed with the county it's it's available out there to be had but there's not really a way to to take it all in without having access to one of these sites now title records and that sort of thing can help you out but what you have to do is basically find an agent uh, a real estate agent broker whoever you're working with that has access to a site like this and then they can kind of reverse engineer it and say okay you're looking in say huntington beach okay you want to be in this area of Huntington Beach. So now you kind of have a location and then they can kind of work backwards and say, okay, let's go find all of the loans that are FHA, VA, and or USDA. Here, there's gonna be zero USDA. And then you go back and you try to find, hey, it, what is their interest rate? How much equity do they potentially have? Because you know, it, it it's not an easy um, solution, Josh, and, and especially here in Southern California. Now, if you're in a market, like Georgia, right? Georgia's known, for example, for having a lot of FHA loans. Um, and, and so if you're in a market like that where there's a lot more of a type of loan, it might be a little bit easier to find an assumable loan. Or if you're around a military base, right? Carlsbad, Oceanside, here in Southern California, you got a lot of VA buyers, right? Some of these buyers have to relocate out of state. Those are a really good opportunity to, okay, this guy's moving. He just purchased a couple of years ago. This might be my opportunity. So Josh, with that said, let's talk about some of the loan programs, how they work. We mentioned them earlier, FHA, VA, USDA. FHA and USDA pr work pretty similar for the most part. VA is one that works a little bit differently. And the reason why many of you listening are going, bro, what are you talking about? I'm not a veteran. Why are you talking about me assuming a VA loan? You don't have to be a veteran to assume a VA loan if the seller is willing to cooperate with that. And they may not be willing to because this is one where there is an actual downside to the veteran borrower. When the veteran gets approved for a VA loan, they are using a portion or all of their VA entitlement. When they sell that property, that entitlement gets restored. If they sell it and allow another veteran to assume the loan, and that veteran substitutes their uh, entitlement and eligibility, then it also gets restored. If they sell to you, a civilian, then their entitlement is still used up. And for us here in Southern California, the majority of their entitlement is used up, so they wouldn't have any bonus or secondary entitlement to go buy another property with their VA loan. So it's not to say that they wouldn't be willing to do it, but they might not be willing to do it because there is a downside for them. So that is specific to VA borrowers, any or VA sellers, any seller considering selling to you and allowing you to assume the loan needs to make sure as part of that assumption process, they get a release of liability, that they are released from the liability from the loan. So that's the important part about the process for them. They don't want to have uh, any liability should you fail to make your payments. I mean, obviously you're, you're qualifying on the way in, so you are a good risk now, but as with anything else, things can change and it could present a problem further down the line when they've moved on to their new home. But you're dead right, Jeb, for the most part, FHA, VA, USDA, the process is going to be very similar. You're going to contact the servicer and you're going to prove that you qualify. And through that process, we want to make sure that the seller is getting a release of liability and uh, a VA to VA sale with an assumption that we're substituting the veteran buyer's uh, entitlement so that that veteran can then move on and use their VA eligibility on a, a new property. So I'm going to do something a little bit differently than we've done in other episodes. Josh, I'm going to do a little rapid fire. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. You can just come back with a quick answer on them. These are questions that I think would come up when talking about assumable loans. First one is, can I do this for an investment property? Generally, no. Um, you would always want to check with the servicer, but for uh, a VA, not possible. I would assume FHA and USDA would be the same. They are only making this available to owner occupants. Can I assume your loan between an agreement between you and I without the lender ever knowing? 
You could, but that is not an assumption. That is taking it subject to the existing financing. And when you do that and you circumvent the process, you not only do you, did you not assume the loan, you cannot later assume the loan and the seller doesn't get a release of liability. So to you as a buyer, you accomplished what you wanted. You got their low interest rate. It exposes the seller to a ton of risk there if you were to fail to make your payments. They've deeded the property to you. You are now the owner. Their loan is in place. Place and they can do nothing to compel you to pay it off or refinance it. It's kind of similar to a divorce situation where both uh, husband and wife are on the loan and the property goes to one and they fail to make the payments after they've deeded off that property. So a lot of risk there. Can it be done? Yes. And the last risk there is that most of these loans do have a due on sale clause. And that says that if the seller becomes aware of it, which is not hard because there's a change in ownership in the public record, they can call it due. 99 times out of 100, they won't if you make your payments on time, but they could. Got it. Uh, can I assume a conventional loan? I know you answered this earlier, but I want to ask it again. Fannie Freddie guidelines do not allow it on fixed rate mortgages. I, it may be possible. Uh, it's a gray area. may be possible on an adjustable rate mortgage. And I would say just like everything else, if you don't ask, the answer is no. So if you're talking to a seller and the seller seems to be open to it, whatever type of loan they have, call the servicer, ask, find out. Now, here's a question that I don't know the answer to. If I assume your loan, what happens to my property taxes? Do I get reassessed based on current value? Is it because there's no purchase agreement happening here? I mean, in theory, um, I'm assuming your loan through the bank. What happens in that scenario? It's a standard sale. So it's just a different type of financing. You are using their assumed loan to finance your purchase. So it is no different. For us in California, where we have Prop 13 limits to tax increases, you are going to be reassessed at the sale price. Every other area, whatever their typical process of reassessing annually, you will not have any protections due to assuming the loan. You're not assuming their entire transaction. You're assuming the seller's financing. Got it. So I think, I mean, for me, Josh, you know, I think this is pretty easy to comprehend. I know there's a lot, again, I say gurus out there, but there's a lot of people at the moment preaching this idea that these are very easy to find. You just got to go out and find somebody that has a lower interest rate and they're just going to give you their house at, 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 you know, why would a seller in this market do that? We've talked about that, um, but it's, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Can it be done? It can absolutely be done. So don't think that it's impossible just I wouldn't put all of my eggs in that basket, right? If I were a buyer in this market, I would have another plan. And and that's, you know, as simple as I can say it. I, I would not say, it's like saying, hey, I'm going to wait for foreclosures to happen. Okay, you might find one, but there's also a lot of people trying to do what you're trying to do, even on the assumable side. So just take that into consideration, Josh. What are your final thoughts? I would say it's very similar to, we have buyers coming, hey, I want a fixer. Cool. Lots of people want a discount. What they're generally saying is, I want a discount and I'm willing to take a property in inferior condition to do work on it. Say, okay, there aren't a lot of those properties out there. There are a lot of people wanting and wishing and hoping for them. So hard to find and they generally get bid up. Same situation. Doesn't mean that doesn't happen. We do have buyers that will go out and hunt a, a you know less than perfect property and, and get a discount on it, knowing that they're going to do the work. Kind of the same thing. You are looking for uh, a needle in a haystack. They do exist and you can get them. What I will say is generally the people that I have spoken to who, who have done assumptions are realtors, realtors that I'm aware of, and they're in heavily VA areas. So they have veterans getting a permanent change of station into the area, a veteran getting a permanent change of station out of the area, and through their networks, they're able to work together. Um, and generally the, the veteran PCSing in has a big down payment to cover that equity gap. So they do happen. They're not like the, the mythical purple unicorn. They, uh, they are more like a zebra. You don't see them nearly as often as, as horses, but they're out there. So just kind of going back to that original topic, if you think this is what you want, you're gonna have to be flexible and it is not going to be as simple and you're not going to have as many options. So there's some downsides, but there's a very big and obvious upside in that if it's a $300,000 mortgage and it's at 3% versus 7%, that's an 800 to $1,000 difference in the monthly payment, it's huge. And I, I would say to add to that, understand that if you're in that position and you're negotiating with a seller or perhaps you're a seller, the seller holds all the power here. I mean, really all the power in a position where they can even charge more for the home. You're not likely to 
find an assumable loan and get a discount on the property. Why would the seller, you have to think, put yourself in the seller's shoes. You, you should be willing to pay a little bit more for that home than it's worth because your monthly payment is, is likely going to be considerably less than it would be otherwise. So if you're in that position, just make sure you understand the full process. Even if that seller is in a position where they need to do something, they still hold the power because just like we said, you know, if there's one person willing or, or able or wanting to assume that loan, there's probably five other people right behind them. So once you make it known, then it's, it's you know, you're probably going to have a line at the door of people willing to, uh, to do the same thing. So with that, Josh, uh, you know, what I want to say is this episode, as I mentioned earlier, came about because someone mentioned it. And that's why I want to reach out to you guys. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you want us to talk about. We do what we want to talk about. But ideally, in becoming the educated home buyer, because Josh and I have been professionals in the industry for 20 plus years, both sides, some of the basics we forget. Um, we, you know, just kind of brush over them without a lot of detail because it's, you know, common knowledge to us. But that's where, you know, we can want to reach out to you and just ask, what is it you want us to cover? If there's something we haven't done, let us know. We'd be happy to do it. Um, but until next time, adios. Amigos.